question, there are few more challenging issues, more important issues for social scientists than, than corruption with its debilitating effect on innovation and economic growth and its equally debilitating effect on the international, international community's willingness to, to help on this, uh, on this front. I'm delighted to say that, that this evening we've got um, two people who can speak with singular authority on, on uh, this topic. Um, Susan Rose Ackerman is the Henry R. Loops Professor of Ju Jurisprudence at Yale University. She has a joint appointment in the political science department. She's the author of the prize-winning uh, Cambridge University press book, uh, Corruption and Government, which I think is been translated into 17 languages, um, no doubt counting, um, and she is uh, simply the leading academic authority on, on our topic. And Lawrence Cockcroft is a um, uh, development economist. Um, he's um, the author of a new book, um, Global Corruption, and um, he's a board a uh, member of Transparency International, which is, um, I suppose, with its measures of, of um, corruption cross-nationally, has had a huge impact in terms of the empirical study of, uh, of the issue. You know, as, as Amnesty International is to human rights, I think transparency is to, to, to corruption. So, Please join me in welcoming our, our guests tonight. <laughs> They'll each speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have um, 30 minutes for question and answers afterwards. So thank you. comparable measure, comparable 
uh, assessments in countries like Pakistan and Central America, Ecuador, uh, which come up with much the same kind of figure. So many people are confronted with the provision of services which are intended to be free but actually cost quite a lot. And that has a hugely depressing effect both on people's incomes and on uh, their perception of the way society operates with very negative consequences. So how do we really break down small-scale corruption? What is it really all about? There is on the one hand small-scale corruption, the survival of people, civil servants who are very badly paid, who need to survive. So they may charge maybe a very modest sum in order to get by. But then of course once people find they can do that, it becomes uh, greed rather than need. So if you find you can earn an extra $30 a month by small-scale corruption, or sometimes obviously more depending on the context, then you may be come to do that as a regular occurrence. But then taking that further, sometimes this is organized in the form of a scam. So this is not uh, petty corruption from below, it's petty corruption from above. And it's the way, it, one needs to look at the way in which, for example, a police inspector may organize his policemen so when they go out on the beat they bring a certain amount of funding home. Uh, and this is again now quite well understood. So petty corruption is not always simply a question of survival, not always a question of individual greed. It may sometimes be a question of uh, organization by those who are running, for example, a police force, but this also occurs at the level of ports, uh, harbors, and may explain a lot of the inefficiencies which occur in harbors as different as uh, uh, Dar es Salaam and Mombasa. So that's one area. And uh, as, a, as a variant of that, uh, which is not quite the same thing, I just want to relate, mention what in China is called Guangxi and in Russia, Blatt, where there are interpersonal favors which actually determine outcomes. So if you um, are the uncle of a promising young person who may join the civil service, you make sure he or she gets that job in order to reward your family. And Elena led the neighbor who is uh, a very influential person here at CIS, School of East European Studies, has produced a, a very interesting and very new book on that subject, including uh, which is called, the latest one of which is called Can Russia Really Reform? Uh, and I would commend that to you if anybody's interested in that subject. <coughs> so those are some comments on petty corruption. How much does it cost? A recent survey by TI found that in uh, Mongolia, the annual cost of, of petty corruption was $250 a year uh, per family. So these are really quite significant sums. But if we move on to look at the other drivers of corruption, uh, I want to say something about political finance. Political finance is a, is a key area. And in my view, and it's one of the central themes of my book, the way in which political parties raise money, often from corrupt sources, and then need to recoup the money which their investors have invested in the political success of their party, is a very key determinant of a cycle of corruption. So if we take the case of India, for example, there are fairly reliable figures which show in a constituency in India for the uh, federal parliament, you may have to spend $10 million to get elected. So how does, just imagine the $10 million. How do you raise $10 million? Not by going from door to door to raise a few rupees. You raise $10 million by going to local contractors and sometimes organized crime in order to fund your campaign. But then, of course, those who provided the money <coughs> expect to get repaid. And so that is uh, the way in which the cycle, uh, the process becomes cyclical and is really quite destructive. So political finance, in a range of countries is, is a huge problem. Um, I took the case of India, but if you'd like to look at, uh, for example, um, Italy. Italy since the war, the question of political finance has been extremely complicated. And we all know that um, various elements of the mafia have been involved in that one way or another. Prime Minister Andriotti has just passed away, but actually he was in court four times on, his, on charges related to uh, the Mafia, only one of which stuck, but nonetheless it's, an, it's a clear example of the way in which a lot of uh, party funding in Italy has been raised. And if we take uh, uh, Japan, then the, the role of organized crime in Japan has been quite important, and some analyses suggest that the change of government, which has now been reversed from the LDP to the Democratic Party of Japan, 
was actually achieved because the Yakuza, which is the name for organized crime in, in Japan, became the key players in that outcome. Um, Tanzania is a country I know very well, and there's no question whatsoever that political funding in Tanzania for the dominant party, which is uh, currently in government and has been in government since 1961, is raised from uh, uh, sources which certainly include corruption including the deal which was done by BAE Systems funding uh, a radar surveillance project, um, which was very controversial here uh, a few years ago uh, and still remains controversial. So, so um, even in countries which are trying to kick the habit with rep very reputable leadership, this remains a serious problem. If you take the case of Brazil, uh, some of you may have been following the, the so-called Mensalau case in which under the very successful President Lula, nonetheless, in order to get measures through the Brazilian Congress in about 2005, his office arranged payments to at least 40 congressmen, some in his own party, the Workers' Party, and some in other parties. And those individuals were put on trial for receiving bribes from the President's office last uh, fall, and 40 of them were sent to jail. So this is... Um, a remarkable case, which I'll uh, refer to again before I close, but it's remarkable in the sense that it's very well documented. The circumstances can't be disputed, and it's a huge issue for uh, Dilma Rousseff, the current president, to address. Um, I want to move on in terms of drivers to say something about organized crime more specifically. Uh, from my point of view, working in TI for a long time and looking at the way in which the study of corruption takes place in more academic circles. I think that um, uh, organized crime has been separa has separated too far from corruption. In other words, we tended to have corruption in one box and organized crime in another. Organized crime is dealt with, this argument runs by Interpol, the FBI, in this country by um, entities like uh, the Serious Organized Crime Agency, uh, and actually corruption is in another box. But in practice, and I've already hinted at some of the reasons, organized crime is a key driver of corruption in many ways because organized crime is not only a question of how do you move drugs from Afghanistan to London, for example. It's also a question of how do you uh, buy political commitment from individuals with power. And um, just in case you think that I'm talking only about developing countries, if you look at recent U.S. history, Bobby Kennedy took an amazingly courageous stand in relation to organized crime in the US and laid out that very clearly in a book which he wrote about it um, in terms of his conflict with Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters Union. And in that book he says that he considered at the time, which is obviously the early 60s, that organized crime was a greater threat to the US political system than communism. So there is no country which, exe which is exempt from this question. And I just want to stress that, but I think organized crime is a key issue and if you want to look at the political impact of that, then we only have to look at Mali. Uh, during the last three or four years, uh, United Nations <coughs> Organized Crime Office, UNODC, has been showing that um, drugs coming originally from Colombia, in order to avoid the, the role of the Mexican cartels, have actually channeled those drugs through West Africa and have bought off the leadership in places like Guinea-Bissau, Equatorial Guinea, uh, in order to get drugs moved from Latin America via West Africa to Europe. And several of the groups who were successfully operating in northern Mali and are still certainly part of the scene, including Al-Qaeda in the Sahel, AQM, <coughs> and the uh, Touareg Liberation Front, uh, will have certainly been involved in that process. So there is a spillover between uh, organized crime and political outcomes, which can only be described as something which is fueling corruption in a significant way. Then I want to move on in terms of a, a fourth driver to the role of multinationals. This is an area during the last 15 years, or maybe slightly more, where we've seen a huge amount of activity in terms of the international community trying to persuade, cajole, regulate multinationals in such a way that bribery would be diminished and preferably eliminated as a market force. And I would encapsulate this as saying that bribery much of the last um, 30 or 40 years after World War II, let's forget the earlier period, um, has been much of a strategy for multinational corporations has been to use bribery to expand market share. 
As many of you will know, the U.S. passed pioneering legislation in 1977, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and finally persuaded the rest of the OECD to, to uh, pass the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention in 1997, 20 years later, uh, which has had a significant impact. Susan may uh, interpret, have a different interpretation. I like to be modestly optimistic about this, but we are now seeing undoubtedly uh, a significant impact on multinationals in terms of using bribery as a corporate strategy. But there are still amazing lapses amongst very well-known companies. Walmart in the US, which was um, obviously subject to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act for many years, uh, was found, uh, confessed to being guilty of using bribery as a strategy in Mexico from 2002 to 2008 recently. And Rolls-Royce has um, uh, confessed, if that's the right word, in a plea bargain with the Serious Fraud Office in this country to paying bribes in China over three years in the uh, first decade of this century. However, I would argue that there has been progress in that area, and you might like to raise that during uh, question time. Um, but if we're making progress in that area, we're only beginning to make progress in other areas in relation to multinationals. And one of the controversies uh, surrounding multinationals is the issue of mispricing and whether or not companies are actually manipulating export prices and import prices in such a way they can deprive a given exporting country of uh, the revenue which is due. So uh, this an example of this would be, say, for the sake of example, uh, timber exported from a country such as Cameroon. So typically speaking, European timber companies will export from a country such as Cameroon uh, at a price which is less than the world price uh, on sell the timber into the world market at a much higher price and very often part the difference in an offshore center uh, which might be anything from the Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, Monaco, those particular, that particular category of place. And uh, many of you may know that there's a huge amount of work going on on this issue right now. And before I finish, I will end on a slightly more optimistic note because I think that work is very important. But actually, nonetheless, the fact of the matter is that mispricing, which a few years ago was called transfer pricing, is a very important source of corruption in the sense that it deprives uh, countries of revenue and very often actually there are people in the political elite who are complicit in that process. And then uh, I want to mention something else uh, of a similar nature but which is actually different. And this is in the context of multinationals when a resource is transferred from the illegal uh, sector to the legal sector. So the easiest example to discuss this is the example of Coltan in Eastern DRC, which, um, as many of you will know, is used in electronic circuits, especially in mobile phones. And for many years, the situation has changed a bit in the last year, but for the many years in the late 90s and 2000s, Coltan has been mined by militias in Eastern DRC in a highly corrupt context in which the government of that country has had very little control. Uh, but actually the mining is being controlled by local militias, some of whom are in turn controlled by Rwandese and Ugandan generals in competition with each other in order to get coltan, which is then sold to comptoirs in Kivu and exported to smelters in Kazakhstan, Germany, and the US. Uh, and then as it, as it comes into the system, then it becomes formally a legal product. And so by the time it gets to a company like Nokia, which is manufacturing mobile phones, then we know that it is, as it were, can be safely regarded as part of that system. There's been a lot of work going on on the, uh, the chain, the value chain in that process, and there may be a shift in the way that is done. But that's an example of what I'm talking about in moving a product from the illegal sector to the legal sector. And another uh, example, of actually on a much Largest, even larger scale in terms of value is the bunkering of oil from Nigeria by militia groups in the Delta in which oil is actually captured uh, from pipelines, taken out to sea in small boats, offloaded into, eventually into tankers, and then finally comes into the world market in Rotterdam. Uh, but this is a huge quantity of Nigerian oil is uh, sold in that way. And with the complicity, it's, it's fairly well agreed of uh, political big shots, so this is actually a process which is very corrupt. 
but also receives blessings from some elements of those in the power network in Nigeria. So that's, those are two examples of what I mean by the transfer of product from the legal sector to the legal sector. And of course, that transfers the other way around, from the legal to the illegal. And small arms is a very good example of that, because countries like China and the UK, which are very important manufacturers of small arms, actually export these small arms officially through agents to, uh, say, an importer in, for example, Singapore, who then re-exports them to various conflict zones, with, which are then fed by small arms, which have been exported quite legally. Uh, one hopes that the new arms trade treaty, which was agreed by the UN uh, about two weeks ago, is going to make some dent on that market. But I just want to stress the point that both of these types of transfer are, I would argue, forms of corruption. So um, multinationals are not, as it were, uh, in any sense, um, above the fray. They're certainly part of the process, in my view, and those are things which need to be addressed. But these are not necessarily the only roadblocks to uh, change in relation to corruption. And I just want to talk um, briefly. Don't worry, I'm not going to exceed my half hour. Um, about what I consider to be the roadblocks to change. First of all, uh, a much undiscussed issue is the role of the shadow economy. By the shadow economy, I mean that part of GDP which is not recorded. Now, as I'm sure you all appreciate, in many developing countries, unrecorded GDP, maybe, maybe another 40% of recorded GDP. And this isn't just in, uh, say, Uganda. This is actually across a range of countries. So that includes India and it actually includes Russia, which is a very interesting case in, re in relation to this. And the reason I'm stressing this is that if you can, if you can just uh, think this through, the unrecorded sector is actually a huge reservoir from which payments can be made. So if you're running an SME in Bogota and you um, uh, want to pay off City Hall, then you don't actually um, have to do anything other than pay cash. And so the cash comes from your unrecorded turnover. <coughs> and this provides a, a very effective way of making sure that corruption functions, in this case, in my example, at a municipal level, but it may function at a much larger level. And in Russia, typically speaking, companies may have three books of account. One, the real books of account, two for Russian auditors, and three for international auditors if that company has any international links. And that provides a means, in fact, of payments because the real turnover is larger than the audited turnover. So the, the role of um, uh, the shadow economy is very important and, in my opinion, a very underrated issue. There is somebody called Frederick uh, Schneider at a university in Austria who makes estimates every two years of the size of the unrecorded sector. And that's a very interesting source from which one can uh, trace the scale of this. Um, if you, um, and I want to say something about um, geopolitics, because in spite of the fact that we've had a lot of energy put into fighting corruption by many different sides of government during the last uh, 20 years, actually there's also been another thread going on, because not everybody in governments have been, has been convinced that this is necessarily the right thing to do. So I want to refer here to geopolitics, because in Central Asia, which has, for example, an incredibly low score on Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. All of the stands have a score of about, uh, well, what is now 30 on the way the scale works, out of 100. Uh, the West in general has turned its blind eye to the issue of corruption in those countries. And in fact, European countries, through working with countries like Turkmenistan on energy supplies, have boosted uh, regimes which are fundamentally corrupt. So this is an example of geopolitics triumphing over the interest of uh, countries, maybe in Western Europe, the UK, the US, in dealing with this question. Uh, and if you take another example like uh, Kenya from a different perspective, <coughs> Kenya is a crucial country strategically in Africa. And European countries, the UN, have a, has a huge interest in the survival of Kenya. So that the, uh, as an ongoing state, regardless of the fact that the new president is supposed to be up before the International Criminal Court. So geopolitics have again triumphed in that particular case. 
So the issue, even within Western governments, has certainly not been resolved. Uh, and then I want to say something about an argument about corruption and growth. Uh, there is a kind of um, uh, quite an important line of thought in economic development circles at the moment, uh, which says that we shouldn't worry too much about corruption because, after all, uh, the, uh, the Asian tiger has developed uh, quite satisfactorily while being rather corrupt. And um, this is really just something which um, is uh, not corruption can't be described as a fundamental impediment to growth. That argument used to be around 20 years ago, it then I think went through a different phase, but now it's, as it were, being regurgitated. And for example, Professor Mustak Khan at SOAS over the road here has written about this very widely, and he's a very impressive exponent of the argument. And as a matter of fact, I agree with the point of view that corruption is clearly not an impediment to economic growth. You can't really argue that in the context of China. China's very corrupt but it has a phenomenal rate of economic growth. The point in those contexts, from an anti-corruption perspective, is an argument, in my view, that it's very uh, dangerous to the whole socio-economic, socio-political system. And if you take a country like South Korea, which has been a very successful developer, then nonetheless, it's also true that corruption is a very hot issue in South Korea. Two prime ministers have been jailed on corruption charges, and another committed suicide before he could go to court. So this is not, not exactly a light issue. And uh, I think that um, we need to refine the arguments about uh, corruption and growth much more um, precisely. I think it's very important to understand that much more fully. Um, so those are some reasons why there are kind of roadblocks to a real advance, in my view. And then the final one is the issue of secrecy jurisdictions by which I include the whole offshore business. But offshore is now refined in a rather different way, I think, and offshore really means uh, a whole uh, legal structure in which you disguise the real ownership of assets. So that it's not just a question of does somebody have an account in the British Virgin Islands, it's a question of whether or not actually in the British Virgin Islands there's an account, but that account is ultimately owned by a trust in London, and the trustees actually originate in the Isle of Man but their domicile is Kazakhstan. So this is a typical type, kind of situation. And frequently you have up to 10 layers of ownership. This is why it is so complicated. But the reason for a small degree of optimism in this is that, believe it or not, David Cameron, whom I'm no fan, has announced that this is going to be a key issue for the G8. And there is a lot of work going on on that issue. And whether or not it, it actually is successfully tackled in the G8 uh, then there's another round of attack on the questions in the G20, which has a working group on corruption, uh, which is uh, also focusing on this kind of issue. So there is a moment of change, and I think some kind of um, change will come in the next couple of years to deal with some of these issues. Um, I've got a lot more to say. I won't say it now, but some of the points, uh, other points may emerge during question, <coughs> question time. So I'll just close for the moment. agenda. This is a um, based on an edited book that I'm about to um, uh, publish with something called Carolina Academic Press. It was based on a, on a conference that I organized um, under the Rockefeller Foundation in, uh, and some other help and uh, their wonderful uh, conference center in Bellagio. You kind of feel like you're being corrupt when you're there. You know, so <laughs> <gorgeous>. <laughs> I wish you would be doing anything serious. But it actually turned out to be a very nice um, way of getting together both um, academics and people from NGOs, people from the World Bank, um, a journalist uh, from from here, Michael Wong, uh, to discuss some of these some of these um, some of these issues. Um, um, so corruption is one. Of, whenever you start talking about corruption, people always want to worry about the definition, right? So because it's one of these words, it's got to stand for something bad. So 
people like to put all kinds of bad things under this, under this label. Um, I was at a conference once when somebody wanted to include violence against children on tele violent children's television programs as corrupting the minds of the youth. And of course, that's not a misuse of the English language, you know, to put it that way. It can have these broad things. But I want to talk about this. There's this definition that a lot of people use called the misuse of, which goes the misuse of public power uh, for private gain. Now, that's a, a sentence, almost every word in that sentence is uh, not precisely defined, right? Uh, so, uh, what could misuse be? Uh, what's public? Uh, what, what does power mean? What's private? What's, you know, so, uh, but just to unpack it a little bit, I think part of the issue is that there's a range of things that people want to talk about here, and some of them are clearly fit in this category. Uh, bribery, embezzlement, fraud, um, uh, will fit in that, um, in the category um, of, of misuse of, 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 uh, of, of power. Uh, even if somebody might argue that the, the underlying rules are so horrible that um, misusing those rules is actually overall beneficial if you're Jeremy Bentham, right? I mean, still, <laughs> uh, well, I just went and saw, uh, um, 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 it's still, a, um, it's still a misuse of the of the of the of the of the, of the framework, um, but we can also be worried about 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 conflicts of interest, um, about um, uh, about uh, other kinds of, of of uses of power through patronage, even just waste, just sleeping on the job, right? Um, um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the things that are, I think most of us would not find problematic, uh, of, of bribery particularly. Um, then, of course, I think one thing that is important to remember is that uh, we can talk not just about public power, but it could be the misuse of private power. And this is going to be something that we really need some more work on as more th institutions that were formerly public institutions become a private institutions. So as you privatize the railroads, you privatize the telecoms, certain kinds of, of problems um, in the relationship between, say, purchasing agents in those, um, in those corporations or any large corporation and people trying to sell them things um, would come under the heading of commercial bribery. And you, you might not think that was quite as serious as, as uh, bribing the Minister of Transport or, or Telecoms, but it, it, it has some of the same structural uh, uh, form. Um, uh, certainly, when we talk about private gain, what are we talking about? Well, once again, if we're talking about bribery, it, we're talking about a financial gain and the way in which financial gain can be in tension with um, your obligations, your responsibilities, your duties as, a, as an official of, of various kinds. But, as Lawrence was pointing out, we could also be talking about political gain, um, a criminal a beneficial, um, ide ideological gain of one, of one sort of, of another. Um, so as I said, let's surround at least talking about the uh, more the, the things that would I think we, 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 I don't think we get much argument would fit in the sort of corruption category, bribery, embezzlement, fraud, things like that. Um, and then, but then there is also the question of how do we want to think about this as a problem? Um, I think the first way in which people tend to think about it is as an ind problem of, an, of individuals, as an individual bad guy who has succumbed to, trans, uh, to temptation, uh, taken money in return for giving the contract to, um, to the firm that uh, pays the uh, most for it, um, or has organized some kind of bureaucratic, uh, distribution of some kind of bureaucratic benefit uh, as a, in, in, a, uh, in a way in which he is extorting uh, payoffs from people who want this. Uh, who want this benefit? And the way of thinking about this is, as the, we got to get, got to get the, at the individual. The criminal law is going to come in there and penalize this person, or create a situation in which there's enough of a chance that the person is going to be caught, that uh, that it acts as a, as a, a deterrent. And of course, that is an important part of the way in which corruption ought to be, ought to be thought about. Um, but the way in which I mostly try to think about it is to say that's not, uh, uh, not, um, not sufficient, and all it may ultimately be. Um, not do much to the problem if you just get rid of one bunch of bad apples, you turn around next year, come back, don't change anything else, there's going to be another bunch in there. Um, and that we, you need to think be, beyond the individual incentives to what is it about the way the, the, uh, the system is working that's producing those incentives. Uh, um, are the, um, uh, do we need to really <coughs> redesign the system so that there are fewer incentives for corruption, for example, by 
uh, having less discretion for public officials, so there's fewer chances where it's up to them to decide you know, who gets a, a, a benefit. Um, should we make the system more transparent and accountable so there are more ways in which, uh, which the users of the service or other kinds of observers like the press can, can um, uh, or civil society groups can figure out kind of what's, what's going on and have some way to hold things uh, people to, to, uh, to account. Um, what's the role for, um, for uh, trying to uh, change people's values, people's norms about what turns out to be uh, acceptable? My own view is that that's a, um, that kind of attempt to change people's um, views uh, needs to go along with some real systematic change or, um, or those very nice people who have become, um, feel as if it's good to be honest will end up being suckers, right? So you, it needs to be credible that you can um, uh, behave in, a, in an honest uh, way uh, most of the time. So I want to talk a little bit about the role of international actors. It's obviously a big, complicated, ball wax uh, um, uh, problems. And I think when we think about the role of international actors, we have to step back a second and ask, what is it we're wanting them to be doing? What should they be thinking about? And that, Corruption is a, um, uh, in some ways, not a problem in and of itself. It's, a pro it's something that makes other goals more difficult to achieve, and that we need to ask about what are those goals that we're concerned about, because that's going to affect what you might want to think the most about. Um, is it economic growth that's a problem? Is it economic growth sort of stagnant or uneven or not going on very well? Um, is it poverty and human development, uh, low levels of human development, high levels of poverty that are especially the, um, uh, the concern? Is the, is the concern basically with the international marketplace, with the fact that there's not a level playing field? This is what tends to be, what the business community tends to be most of the, worried about, who, the, those who want to avoid corruption, is that the um, playing field is level. Uh, you know, the American firms are more subject to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, to, uh, Forced more aggressively in the U.S. than other places, um, so that's what is what we want to uh, be particularly um, uh, worried about. Or is it more a political problem that the government, the governments, uh, are not so um, are, are less legitimate because they're they're um, embedded and viewed with a lot of a lot of, 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 of corruption. So the basic the only basic point is that when that corruption needs to be thought about, I think Lawrence was saying this as well as embedded in sort of larger efforts to deal with, with a set of problems. He was particularly also mentioning organized crime uh, as a, as a, as, as a, as a sort of big issue of which um, corruption could be a, uh, could, could be a, a piece of the, of, of, of the problem. So how is it that international actors get, uh, in, get what, what kind of international actors are we, are we talking about? Um, well, obviously, um, we're, we're talking about the international financial institutions and the bilateral donors, I mean, the things like the World Bank, the IMF, um, the other uh, regional um, uh, development uh, banks, uh, things like DFID here or the USAID, um, donors of various, uh, of, of various kinds um, who have recognized that their own um, attempts at uh, aiding uh, development um, and reform have been uh, undermined by um, corruption not only in their own programs, they may be particularly worried in a kind of clean hands way about let's be sure our own grants don't have corruption in them, but also that the broader purposes are being, are being harmed by the existence of, of, uh, of, of corruption. Uh, the, the, uh, another set of international actors um, are ones particularly focusing on law enforcement. I think Lawrence is exactly right that, that we need to be that these institutions should be talking to each other more. World Bank has always been very nervous about like mentioning the word crime, you know, and everything they do. They've gotten a little, little less nervous, but they're still nervous about it. Uh, but the, the, the uh, but they're not just talking about criminal law here, that's one piece of it. Uh, there is also, as you I'm sure know, a, 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 a international regime uh, that has to do with the enforcement of international contracts, uh, particularly the international arbitration uh, of regime. Um, and um, that um, uh, is operating sometimes under bilateral investment treaties, sometimes in a purely commercial, uh, in a commercial way, and it is sometimes alleged that there has been corruption in those in, in those in those contracts. Uh, and that structure, and we can talk about this more later if you want, but that structure has a 
um, difficulty, shall we say, uh, dealing with allegations of, of, of corruption. And as, as, as there, somebody counted up the number of cases in which corruption was involved and came up with 38 of them. Uh, but in most of them, it was not a kind of a central issue or it was dismissed in one, in one way. There's been one recent case involving Kenya called the Old Dirty Free in which they did actually void a contract. Uh, the, the arbitration um, panel avoided a contract uh, because of allegations of corruption that both sides admitted had occurred in the, um, at the time that the contract was put into to place. Um, then, of course, there are a whole range of, of non-governmental organizations. Here I would include also journalists. Uh, who are acting in a range of different ways that I think are, is, are interesting to try to understand better. So to some extent, they're pressure groups uh, inside countries. Sometimes they're pressure groups internationally. Transparency International, of course, is in that, in that category. Sometimes they're basically information providers, uh, like um, Global Integrity, that's, that, of course, has an anti-corruption agenda, but is, is, it's, its role is basically to kind of let people know what's going on. Um, be uh, publicized uh, things, do research, um, and have become a, 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 a very important, I think, in putting the, the keeping the issue uh, before the public and before and before decision makers. And then finally, of course, the uh, multinational uh, uh, corporations um, that um, are can, are operating in a global world in which corruption uh, is occurring at various levels in their businesses, and how do they? How do they deal with it? And for them, um, um, they might prefer a world in which nobody had, if they think they ha have good businesses, prefer a world in which there was not, uh, not, much, uh, not, not much corruption, but they have faced uh, collective action problems as individual, as individual firms. Um, so, um, so if we think about those actors, put them together with these um, sets of, of of goals that range from more efficient uh, markets to growth and poverty alleviation to uh, more efficient international markets um, to uh, enhanced uh, government uh, legitimacy. Uh, what is it that international bodies um, uh, can do? Uh, and I think there's a, there's a, a, a certain amount of, of anxiety in these international bodies about what can they do on the margin, what have, what are, it's not easy to get um, sort of easy wins, um, not only because it's hard to get the political buy-in from the countries where you're working or get the resources to do it, but also it's going to be hard ex post to measure whether anything's happened. Right? So, um, um, uh, and the, so one of the things that international bodies could obviously do is provide information. So. Um, one form of information is the Transparency International Index. There was a version of that that the World Bank uh, put out uh, for, for, for a while that ranks countries, rates countries, as if they were gymnastic stars, right? But it ranks them on one to 10, 10 is good. Uh, and, um, um, but these indices are, as they are quite easy, quite uh, strong to tell you, our, our perceptions, that this is not hard numbers, they're derived from other people's estimates, they're putting together estimates that many of which are coming from business consultancies which are advising firms on where to, to um, invest. So they're capturing something about the relationship between the government and society. If you, know, if you score very low, there's probably some problem there in the relationship between the, the private sector, both citizens and businesses, and the and, um, and the government, if you, start, uh, if you score very high, uh, things are probably um, a pretty um, uh, uh, regularized and, and sort of legally, uh, legally grounded. But this whole range in the middle, if you look at a, at a graph, you know, putting together, I should have it here, the, the TI index was say the UN Human Development Report. Um, well, this basically shows the better off countries have lower levels of corruption, the worst off countries have uh, high levels of corruption, but there's a big chunk in the middle that with a lot of variation in there. And it's basically uh, because the phenomena of corruption can't really be captured by a, a number like six. Right? Um, it's a, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it varies. Sometimes it's the judiciary that's very corrupt. Sometimes it's the police. Sometimes it's the educational uh, system. 
I mean, I'm an old micro economist who sort of transmogrified into becoming a law professor and a, a political science professor, but that's still my home, you know, in kind of industrial organization. Let's look at the individual sector and try to figure out, you know, what's going on in the education sector. What are the incentives for corruption in the mining sector? Let's look at that to try to figure it out. And it may be very different incentives because it's what we're doing is we're seeing the price system show up in places where it's kind of not supposed to. And uh, as if you studied economics, you know the price system shows up in all kinds of places where it is supposed to. And it's, it's quite a lot of variation there. We need to, need to uh, kind of understand that. So there is this cross-country data, which I think served a function of, of helping the debate get going about the issue. Um, I actually feel guilty here because I, the person who released this data was a man named uh, Graf Lomsdorf, Johann, uh, who was then studying for his PhD in Germany. Uh, and he was looking for some data on corruption. And I said, oh, look, there's been an article just published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics that has in the back a, a, a data set that comes from the, uh, the Economist, um, one, of, one of the Economist magazines uh, background. And I sent it to him, and then he found some other data. Uh, and that became the TI, that became the TI <laughs> index. I thought it was just helping somebody write his dissertation. Um, and, and, but instead, something came out in Der Spiegel, you know, with every country and every. Uh, so I thought that was not a good idea, but it was kind of a lesson to me in the kind of public relations value of, of numbers. Um, but I do think at this point it's not really very helpful you know, because it, it doesn't, it's, it isn't, it doesn't, it isn't linked very carefully to policies. I mean, we, what we need to really understand is the relationship between policies and outcomes. And there, I think international organizations like the World Bank, particularly, can be helpful. Um, I mean, they they have some they can make as a condition for providing resources that is directed toward a good government reform a um, an evaluation component, a component that requires you to measure the the baseline of you know how what is the educational system uh, at the start, how many teachers are not coming into work. But what do we know about whether people have to pay to get their jobs? Do a baseline, try a policy, and see whether it worked or not. Now, of course, it's country specific. It worked in you know, one state in India. But I tend to think that there are a lot of, of course, there are a lot of, 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 of potential generalizations possible here that, are, that need to take account of intercountry differences, but that can also focus in on some systemic institutional things that that occur in, in, in many different uh, in many different places, um, and um, as long as the researchers will try to take account of anything that's really unique to the particular space, um, it does seem to me that the um, the uh, the aid and lending organizations could do a better job at, at providing more information on particular uh, programs, a, 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 you know, redesign of the delivery of particular programs, as well as looking at the, the more generic reforms at the level of accountability and transparency. Um, so first, you, know, um, um, uh, uh, you mentioned somebody studying um, the international anti-corruption, uh, not international, sorry, um, uh, national anti-corruption agencies. There are a lot of countries <coughs> that have anti-corruption agencies. Um, they got rather fashionable after Hong Kong and Singapore uh, put them into effect when they were still British colonies, city-states, British colonies, not your typical country, um, and had some success in reducing um, uh, uh, corruption. Not surprisingly, generalizing the, that model to other places had problems in when it was generalized. But there's a woman at the World Bank, Francesca Bacanatini, who's gotten a lot of data on different uh, and the corruption agencies in different countries, and is able to make some comparisons and say, well, under these conditions, they seem to work pretty well. Under certain other conditions, they, they don't seem to work anymore. I think you know, they're, they're not surprising. For example, if the anti-corruption agency is under the thumb of the autocratic ruler of the country, well, it doesn't work too well. Right? I mean, it's used to get after the rulers, people he doesn't like. Um, but, um, but she has a, has a more, a more a richer, um, a, 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 set of evaluations that could be helpful to a country that wanted to um, set up one and to outsiders who wanted to give them advice about how to do that and wanted to make the support conditional on, on uh, holding, uh, carrying out certain kinds of conditions. Um, so clearly an important part 
of the role of the, of the international aid agencies <coughs> is in um, not just being an information bank, as Danny Roderick likes to call it, but as being a, a, a generator of, 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 of credible information about what kinds of, of policies may, may work and may not. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and may not so, and, and may not work. Um, um, and we have certainly plenty of, of ideas, uh, sort of in principle ideas and examples about what about what might about what might work. Um, another set of things that international actors <coughs> um, can do and have done <coughs> is support things at the at the international um, uh, level that have to do with. Um, so, uh, that both have to do with sort of supporting, um, how do I say it, <coughs> I international bodies that support um, domestic um, institutions or individuals who are working on their own inside of those countries for reform of, 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 of various kinds. Um, and then secondly, international organizations that are um, uh, uh, Working in ways that should make the international marketplace more uh, more competitive and less corrupt. So the first set of things are a set of international professional networks that whatever we slaughter writes quite a, a lot about. We now have um, pretty strong um, professional uh, networks for things like ombudsmen, um, uh, the heads of supreme audit offices, uh, bodies like that, where the where the where the people with inside the country may be a bit embattled, even if they were set up with the goal of being um, sort of independent watchdogs. It's always hard to be an independent watchdog and people don't like you if you really are being a watchdog, right? Um, and to have some kind of backstop uh, at the international um, uh, level through an international network that meets, that has a, that has a sort of professional association is, is, um, is, is helpful. Um, there have also been some more volunt sort of voluntary uh, moves, um, particularly trying to involve the business community. I don't think any of them have been particularly strong. I mean, there's something called the UN Global Compact, which has added a bunch of ethical things that businesses are supposed to do, and <coughs> corruption was added to that <coughs> uh, recently. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's, I think it's a nice gesture. It doesn't have much much, much, much clout, but it, it, it would be, it's a, a fair question whether something like that could have, have more clout. The one might be slightly more positive example is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which um, both countries and firms would sort of sign up to and promise to report payments that they received on the country level and made on the firm level um, with respect to getting contracts in oil and gas or in hard rock minerals. That has, the, that has been incorporated by law into the Dodd-Frank um, Act so that um, US, for, for US companies, it's, it's uh, now no longer a voluntary thing. And it, um, it actually was the, the rules that were promulgated under that kind of open-ended statutory language are, are, pretty, uh, are pretty strong. So we'll see what, 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 what comes out of that. And then, of course, there are the international treaties, the OECD the treaty, the UN treaty, um, uh, that are um, meant to try to put some international umbrella uh, over, um, over um, uh, uh, the fight against corruption. But these don't have any kind of real hard international court or anything. Right? So they're very much relying on uh, domestic uh, energy. There's a working group at the OECD. There's some people at the UN who care about it. Um, and they, I think they are, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic about what's going on um, under those treaties. We'll see, you know, the, you know Britain finally passed a, a new anti-bribery law, you know, in last year. So I'm curious to hear learn from you what's, you know, what's happening there. For a long while they claimed that, the, or you claimed that the law from 18 something, you know, was just fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it's, you know, it's a slow process. Um, I was pretty distressed by the, the case you had a while ago of uh, dealing with um, the, the one that was called El Yamama, meaning, of course, the dove. Right? Was, that is a, um, was a, was a, a case that was quashed, uh, an anti a corruption case that was quashed by the Attorney General a number of years ago. Uh, 
But we have these bodies out there, and so there's a, a these, 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 these treaties. Um, um, as I said before, I won't say more about it right now, uh, I, I think we need more study and look at the, at the international um, civil law, uh, I mean civil as opposed to criminal, not as opposed to common, um, the, the contracting regime, uh, because where a lot of the large-scale corruption is occurring is in the, is in the letting of large-scale contracts and the letting of concessionary contracts and privatization deals. Um, and if disputes arise under those deals, they will often go to international arbitration which is a much less transparent way of resolving disputes than in any national courts. Um, and um, it, it does seem to be a place where there needs to be more, uh, more uh, concern by the NGO community uh, as, as, as well as governments about what's, what's coming out of that, of that, um, of that, um, of, of those, of those, of those um, So, um, uh, so finally, of course, the other, and I've almost really said this before, the, the final way in which international institutions are, 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 be, are affecting what's going on is not just through providing information and not just through doing things that, the, that are purely international that you hope have domestic uh, effects, uh, but also tr uh, trying to sponsor programs inside of countries that will reduce the level of corruption. I already talked about some of these possibilities uh, 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 before. Um, um, uh, particularly the need to um, organize these things so that they, so that some lessons can be learned and, and, and the um, whatever successes or failures occur are transferred um, or can be, can, can feed into a, uh, a, 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 a broader kind of knowledge base on what, on what, uh, what works and what doesn't. Um, it is, a, uh, you know, if you talk to people at the World Bank who have been working on this issue for now a number of years, I mean, I, I spent a, I was a visiting scholar there in 95, 96 when the Wolfram Sun, not Wolfowitz, Wolfram Sun, was just beginning to get, to talk about it. Um, and so I followed it for, for a while um, since um, uh, leaving there. Um, you know, the, the people who have been most committed to the anti-corruption uh, agenda are feeling, I think, a little demoralized. Um, and, um, and and it is it, 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 it is of course partly because it is it bumps up against political opposition all the time. I mean, it's a, and um, sort, of, sort of finding and this is uh, and so it's this set of uh, of international um, interventions that are going to be the most controversial. Providing knowledge, oh, fine. Providing setting up an international body, okay. But actually going in there and trying to reform the judiciary in Peru, well, that's going to bump up against the judges and what they want, right? Uh, 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 reforming the customs service uh, in Mozambique. Well, there are people who are benefiting uh, from, uh, from that. Uh, so it's going to be, so, so there's a, and, and if you combine that with the fact that we don't have as good concrete information about what works and what doesn't, even if we have quite good uh, conceptual stories about what should work, um, it, it, it makes the process uh, uh, difficult. Um, but um, I do think it's, it's, it, it, that, that it's important um, to keep uh, working in this, uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in this area. Um, and um, what my question, which I really asked before, is is there more possibility for the, for the aid agencies to use whatever leverage they've got with the countries where they're where they're where, the, where they're working to do a better job at, at evaluating what's uh, what's what's going on to kind of have quite a focused program that you actually kind of learn something from, um, as opposed to just you know seeming to be coming in and bossing people around. Right? Uh, so um, uh, so that so I do think we need some more kind of micro analysis at the at the sector uh, level there to see what's um, uh, see what's what, what's 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 happening. Um, and um, um, you need, we need to, and, and anti-corruption needs to be thought of as a, as a piece of a broader, prob, a more broader um, strategy of, for example, promoting economic growth and reducing poverty, or increasing the democratic legitimacy of the government, or increasing the competitiveness of international markets, and it may even make it a more, a more um, uh, 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 attractive piece of a broader puzzle rather than just sort of standing over another 
So, um, so I guess uh, one one way to, to to say that is that you sometimes hear in the rhetoric about corruption a kind of a, a rhetoric of purity, you know, of, of zero corruption. We're the really good people, and everything everybody has to be very good and very very pure. Well, that would be very nice, but um, um, everybody recognizes that reducing corruption is itself has some costs. Um, I think it's where both of our backgrounds in economics, or some of my backgrounds in economics, um, uh, uh, help sort of guide uh, the thoughts here. Um, speaking in the land of Jerry Bentham, this is probably, he's probably still has a little sway in this, <laughs> in this place. Um, I certainly wouldn't characterize myself as a hardcore uh, utilitarian by any uh, stretch of the imagination. And some of the goals that we're talking about here of fairness and uh, fair, fairness at a substantive level, fairness at a procedural level, are not maybe so easily translated into, into um, utility maximization. Uh, but the idea that you're, when you're thinking about policy, you're thinking about the relative costs and benefits of, of, of alternatives, uh, recognizing that nothing's going to be perfect, um, is, um, is an important way to, you know, to, to come at this um, uh, uh, come at this uh, problem. So it's, it's, I guess it's just a, 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 a final thing to kind of defend economics as a, as a, as opposed to, it's not this cold, nasty bunch of people who just look at numbers, but as a, as a, as something that recognizes the, recognizes costs as well as benefits to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to doing things. Um, so thank you very much and hope we can get you back.